first of all, again, welcome. Welcome to our event that is organized by uh, ID20 Institute from IDRIA, from the west of Slovenia, um, and in collaboration with the Center for Creativity at the Museum of Architecture and Design. And this whole event, and basically not just the event, but also the, the whole program that we're uh, starting with this event uh, is part of the partnership of network platform of Center for Creativity and is co-financed by the European Union from the European Regional Development Fund and by the Republic of Slovenia. The program of today's event is quite straightforward. First, we have two uh, welcome, uh, welcome uh, speeches by myself, and that's what's happening now, and later on by Anja Zorko, the head of Center for Creativity. And then we have one short presentation and another one a little bit longer presentation. Both of these presentations deal with entrepreneurship plus cultural heritage. So how do we combine these two, um, these two elements? And of course, that is the point of this whole uh, event to first of all, um, see what's, what has already been thought about these two topics in the combination of these two topics. And later on, and this is the main part of the event is to discuss uh, and to just uh, see and hear your uh, proposals, your ideas and your comments on what we're about to start this year. And, and that discussion, as I said, it will be the main part of this program. This event is intended to, uh, to get feedback, to get your feedback uh, on what we're about to do this year uh, in Idria in Slovenia. Uh, we have invited a few uh, participants and that will be um, with whom we want to uh, exchange experiences, exchange uh, ideas and comments, but of course also many other uh, people uh, have joined us and you're also welcome to take part in the conversation. Feel free to jump in, comment. Um, as I said, uh, we want to hear your opinions and your comments. Uh, so do not uh, hesitate on, on taking part in the conversation later on. And now, before we head on, I would like to give um, I would like to give you the opportunity uh, to Anja Zorko to say a few words. Anja. Thank you. Uh, hello uh, from my side uh, and from the side of Center for Creativity. Uh, we are really happy that we are today a part of this event, uh, which is taking place online, but uh, nevertheless organized by our partner organization uh, in, in totally different uh, part of Slovenia. Uh, because um, as a center for creativity, uh, which is the first national platform for development and support of culture and creative sector in Slovenia, um, our aim is to develop projects that are somehow on the crossroad of different sectors, different disciplines, and uh, also in the cross section of art, experiment, entrepreneurship, and of course, business. So. Um, Heritage Lab is, is um, actually presenting uh, what we are supporting and developing through our programs, uh, through uh, our events, and through our uh, partnership network um, uh, with projects like uh, Heritage Lab. So, um, as the Center for Creativity is uh, actually run by Museum of Architecture and Design in Ljubljana, our, our interest in, in heritage and development of heritage in a way uh, that uh, supports also the creative business ideas, it's, it's very, very important. So um, we 
hope that uh, with this project and uh, with your inputs, uh, projects, cooperation, uh, we will be able to develop uh, something new and also to support this kind of activities, not only in Ljubljana uh, or Maribor, but also in Idria and other uh, centers, creative centers in Slovenia. So I wish you all the best and uh, enjoy this event. Thank you, Anya. Thank you for the kind words. And also thank you to accepting us to be part of your large family of uh, events and programs. Okay, we continue. Um, but before we, we head on, uh, we would want to invite you to uh, a quick, um, a quick uh, meter of, of your opinions and or your uh, your uh, yeah your opinions so we invite you to go to uh, www.menti.com to a website and enter that code that you see here on the screen so 4121343 uh, because we have a question for you okay and the question is what comes to your mind when hearing cultural heritage is a business opportunity Okay, so yeah, we see that three words are actually popping out. This is creativity, tourism, sustainability, and then the rest of them are quite equal. Uh, science fiction, so cultural heritage is a business opportunity, is a science fiction, interesting. Slow, and also obvious. Yeah, so the more answers that we get, the, the clearer it is that creativity is the, 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 main, the main thing that you think of, which is good because I think that's a good, um, a good starting point to try to combine these two aspects. So cultural heritage and businesses. Uh, great, so that was a quick, quick quick measurement of your opinions um and now we head on with the program first of all i would like to now invite gasper uh, who is part of the technology park of ljubljana um, and also uh, and also a project uh, partner um, in the project uh, zahe uh, which deals with smart accelerators of cultural heritage entrepreneurship uh, Gasper, um, the floor is yours. Also, um, Patrizio, um, Patrizio from Venice has joined. Uh, Fab uh, Fabrizio from Venice has joined us, who is also part of that same project. So, Gasper, and um, feel free for both of you to uh, to present what have what's the point of your project that you have been doing, um, and what have you learned? Because we invited you to. Uh, because your project is in a way uh, a predecessor to what we're doing or uh, maybe a, a, a broader frame of what we're about uh, to do here in Idria. Uh, thank you, Mateusz, for your introduction and all the kind words. I thank you for hosting us today and also the Center for Creativity. Um, as you just said, uh, we are engaged in the SAKE project uh, as Technology Park. Uh, we are facing uh, lots of creative ideas, dealing with creative people and creative industries and so on. But dealing with uh, cultural heritage has been something uh, pretty much new to us. We are dealing much of it with the tourism, but just the cultural heritage, it's something a bit different. Um, we also have like uh, two lab laboratories, like VR lab and some makers lab, and working we can explore and uh, share our ideas on these topics. Uh, as we are engaged in the SAKE project, it's the project that uh, started in the 2019. Um, 
and it's a part of the Interreg Central Europe. It's a partnership of 12 partners, uh, three of them are from Italy, one from Croatia, two from Germany, there's some from Hungary, Poland, and two from Slovenia, except of us, there is also a Maribor Development Agency, uh, and they, they were just renamed to the Podraja Regional Agency or something like that. Uh, we go on. The main objective of the project is to develop and deliver uh, some new tools and approaches that would accelerate creative entrepreneurship within and around the cultural heritage. That's why the project is called SAKE, meaning Smart Accelerator of Creative Heritage Entrepreneurship. Uh, during the project, we would like to achieve many goals. One of it is to develop a central European model that can increase the capacities of public and private actors and somehow promote the sustainable use of material and immaterial culture heritage uh, using the smart innovative technologies in cooperation with different creative sectors. The second thing that we would like to achieve as, as I already said, is to strengthen the role of cultural heritage sites through symbols and values by transforming them into something like smart accelerator of the, not just heritage, but also of creative entrepreneurship. And doing so, we would like also to develop somehow some transferable methodology, and of course a tool set that we to, we, that we could design and implement in, implement some regional local hubs, which like Technology Park of Ljubljana already is, and to, to achieve some new flexible outputs of social innovation uh, that could be equipped with the capability of assisting, for example, CCIs in sourcing and uh, engineering some innovative ideas. Through that, we can also develop and implement strategies and policies uh, that can valorize cultural heritage and exploit uh, another, aspect, ex, uh, uh, another aspect or some different potentials of CCIs that can trigger economic opportunities and employment, not just at regional level, but also on trans regional level. And to do so, we would like to improve capacities uh, of the public and private sectors dealing with the protection and sustainable use of cultural heritage and resources by supporting integrated approaches. Um, that's the reason why we would also like to reach uh, different target groups. Therefore, we are organizing in March and April three training courses. Uh, we are not exactly sure if this would be just like one event or there will be many events on different days, but one would surely be addressed to cultural operators uh, with different teams, as you can see on the slide. And the second one will be addressed to regional authorities and policymakers. And the third will be training for different users like uh, the SMEs, creative professionals, students, and all others who are interested, as well as in modern technologies, uh, or now it's very common to say smart or digital, uh, technologies and also in cultural heritage and all these three trainings will be like some foreground uh, for the pilot actions th that will start probably in May and last till September. The pilot actions A as they are called in the project will be carried out on the national level um, and they will consist of a pitching event for creative practitioners and digital SMEs. Um, I would like to also use this opportunity to invite all the att attendees here at this event. If they have some ideas on cultural heritage or they're already engaged with some SMEs or culture operators, they can apply to this pitching event. Um, they will present their ideas. And the next thing that will happen then will be one matching event where we could we would like to match cultural operators like museums or some private companies that, for example, like they operate for Bostonskaya or something to meet creative and digital startups. And we will also mentor them as a technology part uh, in different aspects to finalize an agreement regarding the IPR or some other issues that they will be facing. The other thing that will happen after it in the project will be the 
pilot action on transnational level, where we will also use the people that are already engaged in the national level, the pilot actions. And we would also like to somehow engage them to cooperate on transnational level uh, with their ideas on cultural heritage or as, as SMEs or as cultural operators and to merge or to find uh, some solution with the partners from other countries. And it would be a great possibility for them to present their projects or their ideas on some transnational event that will hopefully take place live in some of this Central Europe region that are involved in the project. For now, the project has started, as I said, in 2019, but there has been some delays. We have developed some uh, strategy, some methodology, how to engage the people. But uh, now the, the real war starts with all the trainings and so on. So if you're really interested for it, or you have any question about it of, of the project or the pilot actions or the trainings, you can just kind of ask me something about it uh, through mail, or you can also write here if you have some uh, different questions about it and we will get in contact with you. Thank you very much for this opportunity of presentations and let's carry on with this uh, event. Thank you. Gosh, but I have a I have a quick question for you. Okay, and maybe uh, maybe the same question also goes then to uh, Fabrizio. <clears throat> so we invited you to present at our event uh, because somehow we see that what Zahe is doing is similar to what we want to do here in Idria within the Heritage Lab uh, project and within the Heritage Lab lab incubation program. Um, and I don't see these two projects as uh, in any way uh, competitive or whatever. I think that more organizations that work with this, uh, the better. But um, I, want to, um, I want to ask both of you, what, what would your main um, tips and what would your main uh, yeah, tips and tricks be uh, for us on how to, how to accelerate entrepreneurship within the cultural heritage. Would you say that there's some, some, something that you found out in the, in the previous, uh, previous months or previous years that you've been working on these topics, something that, you, that really stuck out and it's really important? Mm, Fabrizio, maybe you have more experience on it. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Fabrizio Panotto from Kofuska University, Venice. Um, and uh, yes, Mateus, to answer your question, we've been reflecting on this, uh, at least in our research laboratory here in Venice on the management of arts and culture, uh, by trying to see whether our cultural heritage sites could be more uh, than just something that you contemplate, that you go to contemplate, uh, and, and whether they could be conceived also mm -hmm. as something in which society and so citizens, but, but, but also entrepreneurs and startups could, could see as a place in which to operate. Um, to, to answer your question, one thing that we think is strategic, but, but it has already in a way been implemented by you in Idria as far as, far as I can see, uh, is the awareness of those who manage, who are responsible for cultural heritage sites, the awareness that, um, as I said before, cultural heritage can be more than just something that you visit and look at and contemplate and learn from and then go back home. Uh, so the, and this, I mean, it, it, may, it may sound obvious for you because you've already made that move, but it isn't for many uh, of those who manage cultural heritage sites, ranging from museums to archeological sites to 
uh, theaters, but, but mainly museums, I would say. You know, people who have been trained in museum management, and management is already a big word because we talk about museum management, but people with a training in muse museology or curatorship, they never encountered management typically in their um, academic um, curriculum or background. So they end up being managers. We tell them they are managers because they happen to have resources to manage and they happen to encounter constraints and they happen to have um, budgets, constraints, uh, and, and so they, they have to forcibly uh, become managers against their will in a way, okay? So that's mm. not what they wanted to be. They, they, they wanted to care for the objects and they wanted to care for historical and cultural value. They wanted to uh, preserve uh, and exhibit. Uh, if, we, if we look at the <clears throat> list of um, uh, actions, expectations that are uh, required to museums in the chart of the International Council of Museums, ICOM, uh, we, we don't see entrepreneurship there. Uh, we, we, we see research, we see education, we see preservation, but we don't, we don't see entrepreneurship. Uh, yes. So the first thing, first tip I would say, but again, obvious for you, the first tip is to work on the mentalities and, and the perspectives of managers of cultural heritage, which, is, which incorporates at least two steps. The first one is talking about management, so, so um, explaining what to manage a cultural site means nowadays, con a contemporary cultural site, uh, which is, uh, again, e even, even before and, and beyond what we are trying to convey with Zache, we, we've seen developments, uh, recent developments in, in the last couple of decades on the notion of what a cultural heritage site should do. Uh, take, for instance, the Faro Convention. So the Faro Convention basically tells that uh, culture and heritage in particular should be opened up to society. It should be a place which is constantly lived uh, by citizens, associations and enterprises. It, it, it should be permeable to the nearby society and economy. Uh, it shouldn't just be a place again in which you put things under protection, under the control of experts. So the, the, there's, there's a kind of um, flexibilization of the notion of expertise. So cultural heritage is not just for experts. And you don't need to be an expert to approach cultural heritage. So, of course, in the perspective of the FAR Convention. And this is something that is, is good on paper. So we have, we have this on, on paper. We have this on the debate. But then when you have to implement it, when you have to move it to the practical dimension, you find a um, complexity or a difficulty in understanding in, in, in the vocabulary, in the language, and, and most of all in, in the background of, mm. of the people. Uh, that's, that's one element. So you, we have to work, and that's something we are doing with the Zahir project. We have to work on the understanding <clears throat> of the managers, of the administrators of museums or, or heritage sites uh, of their activity and their role. But this idea of hosting uh, economic activities is something that they have to be, they have to be to become accustomed to and used to. Uh, and, and that's one element. The other element is, is more, if I may, on, on the policy making uh, side. Um, and it touches upon the notion of the incubator. Uh, in, in, again, in the last decades or more, We've seen a lot of uh, public policies stemming from the EU and then being implemented at the local level, promoting cultural and creative entrepreneurship. But here again, the idea is that in order to promote cultural and creative entrepreneurship, you have to build special purpose sites. So you, you have to move in the direction of the incubator, for instance. So you have to move in the direction of the specific 
typically secluded place in which you put all the creatives. And you hope that by putting all the creatives in a specially devoted place for creativity, then you, you will develop creativity, which is not so automatic. Uh, mm. Because typically creative and cultural entrepreneurs, uh, to make a long story short, they, they tend to escape the, the imperatives of policies that they don't go where you tell them to go. If, if they are truly creative, uh, typically they, they tend to friction. They tend to search for their place. They tend to search for a place of inspiration. So they, but it's their choice. They, they don't go where you tell them to go. And this is historical in a way. Mm -hmm. If you look at the way in which the relationship between creativity and culture and space developed over time, it's a story of appropriation. It's not a story of, of, of direction. Uh, painters, uh, artists, sculptors, uh, they, they, they all um, sort of uh, appropriated, occupied the, the space uh, without policymakers telling them go there or against, yeah. very often against, against uh, political power, telling them do not go there. And they went where they shouldn't have gone. But in the last few years, we've been telling them, come here. Uh, you, we have broadband, it's, it's very well lit, it's, it's very well heated, it's a nice <laughs> place for you to be creative. But that, that recipe is not so automatic because yeah. inspiration of the place plays a fundamental role. And that's the other tip, if you wish, that we are yeah, working yeah, on. Yeah. The other category is policymakers, trying to convey this message of policymakers. If you have money, uh, Again, I'll make it very short. If you have money, don't build yet another incubator. Don't, don't renovate yet another old building, yet another bicycle factory in order to have a new incubator. Use the existing ones. And the existing ones, very often, they have heritage. And that's why they could be attractive to creative and cultural entrepreneurs. Thank you, and I also see how you uh, make a, a made a comment on on what's going on in Ljubljana at the moment, or has been going on in the last few weeks. Um, thank you, Fabrizio, and thank you, uh, both of you. Um, maybe now we uh, turn on the Mentimeter because the question that we have is quite similar to what uh, Fabrizio you've been asking, um, and we have a question. So, what makes more sense? training business skills to heritage experts. So we have heritage experts that need business skills or entrepreneurship, or the other way around, training heritage skills, so understanding heritage and, and the practice of heritage to entrepreneurs. So that's the two, let, let's say two different way of approaches, uh, the way we see it. And maybe if any of you have any comment on, on that dilemma, uh, feel free to comment, yeah. This is, uh, I think, a, a dilemma that also um, Fabrizio, you, you pointed out in your first comment, on your, in your first tip, you were talking about training business skills to heritage experts, or you said management skills to heritage experts. And in the second uh, tip, you were talking about the, the, the other option. So having creatives, creative entrepreneurs, learning how to, or, or fostering their involvement in cultural heritage. If someone has any comment, yeah, feel free to, feel free to just unmute yourself and, and say. Well, if I may here, uh, mm -hmm. there is a, a third category of, um, targets or stakeholders that we include in the Zucker project, which is the one I mentioned more punctually, which is policymakers. Mm. We, we, we thought we can't have policymakers outside this picture. So we are working with three target groups. One, two are those who are listed here. So we, we, we do this with our program. So we, we, we convey uh, a managerial or, or, or business 
uh, so mindset to um, to people in the cultural heritage sector. Uh, we do the opposite, which is much more complex. Uh, but then we have to agree on what we mean by entrepreneurs in which sectors. But one crucial aspect is the one of uh, igniting a, a more reflective and critical discussion within policymakers. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and also a nice comment on the, so there's not a dichotomy, but actually three, three uh, groups that we need to tackle. Thank you. Okay, now we have another question for you and we ask your, your comments or your answers. And this question is, what type of support is the most needed to foster business development in cultural heritage? And here we enlisted four categories. Again, not necessarily um, that these four categories are all of the categories that are needed out there, but um, we just want to hear your comments and see which way you're leaning more. So in that case, you mark, uh, there's a scale, so you have, you have to choose uh, on the scale what's most important or most needed. So looking at the results, we see that business modeling and financing is the most, uh, most needed, looking at uh, your answers, followed by, I, followed by creating social impact. Uh, we also see that yeah, the, the vast majority of you have um, valued business modeling and creating social impact as very important. While, for example, idea development, we have uh, apparently two groups or yeah, two groups. Some of you who, who said that idea development is very important. And then another group of you uh, saying that it's not so much uh, needed. While navigating heritage regime and rules is somewhere in the middle. So all of you are somehow in the middle. Jean and Bostian, I will introduce you later, but maybe now you can, um, looking at that, how you feel, is this what we've, what we've been thinking about when we were preparing the Heritage Lab in Idria? Well, it, it, it certainly seems so. Uh, I mean, <laughs> since, since Bastian is an expert in, let's say, social innovation and myself more on the business side, um, we could say that um, maybe not even intentionally, uh, but we kind of hit those two spots that uh, apparently seem to be the most lacking or mm -hmm. to, to be viewed as the most important. I mean, mm -hmm. especially uh, I can speak maybe more about the business segment. Uh, I mean, with changing business models and uh, maybe even, let's say, cultural institutions having to rely more on other sources of funding than maybe in the past, um, this is becoming increasingly important, yeah. Or maybe yeah. we have tweaked the results so that we are right. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> I was already smiling when I, when I saw what, what popped up, so uh, yeah. that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Rob, I see that you have uh, your hand raised. You want to make a comment? Yeah, thanks, Matthias. Um, yeah, I guess my experience uh, here with uh, our organization, which uh, ironically is called Heritage Lab. <laughs> um, so we're a community interest company essentially trying to bring uh, used heritage uh, places and narratives to support cultural uh, uh, creative entrepreneurship. So. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. I think uh, our experience is that um, we have plenty of entrepreneurs. We are not short of entrepreneurs uh, where we are at all. So plenty of people have got ideas, want to do things um, at various stages of their professional creative careers from startups through to um, people who are, are almost sort of winding down on their professional career but still want to do things. Um, where, where they all 
seem to require help is with the business modeling and finan financing and it may well be different in uh, in everybody's different countries in the uk we have um it, uh, the the sort of finance streams are not very joined up so uh, going back to the previous question i think the the, the uh, support and education for policymakers and funders as well so the, the, the funding institutions are not necessarily the policy making institutions in this country um, but uh, although there are exceptions um, yeah there are some institutions who want to fund heritage there are some institutions who want to fund startups and entrepreneurships there are some institutions who want to fund creativity and culture but trying to get the sweet spot in the middle where <laughs> all the funders understand that actually they're just playing one part in the cog is quite difficult because they all sort of want to believe that you pull one lever and something happens miraculously somewhere else so i i guess for me the two two keys are the modeling and financing support for the entrepreneurs and also because so many of the funders need to measure social impact helping entrepreneurs understand that and then on the policy side helping them trying to understand policymakers trying to understand that um it's more complex than they want it to be. Thank you. And now, so as I said before, maybe this is a strange event uh, because in a way uh, we are presenting something, but we actually want just to um, especially get your comments on what we are uh, about to uh, do. And, and until now, we haven't actually told you what you're about to do here in Idria or what we want to do here in Idria. Um, this is just maybe a, a, a preparatory, preparatory um, activities. So maybe now it's time for, uh, for me to explain what do we mean when we say Heritage Lab and what that is. Um, and yeah, Rob, we didn't know that you have, uh, we didn't know of your existence before. Uh, so it's an interesting coincidence uh apparently it sounds i mean for us and i think that many agree heritage lab sounds really cool uh, so yeah so heritage lab is uh, an activity that we are about to run this year in idria but it's also something that um, we've been developing we here in uh, idria at id20 institute that we've been developing here for the past two years um, it started in 2018 when uh, European Commission published a, a competition for it was the European Social Innovation Competition that was asking for uh, ideas and proposals on how to create new opportunities for young people in their local communities. And then different groups of uh, social innovators, entrepreneurs, um, different uh, different groups, NGOs, businesses proposed their ideas on how to do it. And we, um, our group here in Idria, of course, first thought <clears throat> first thought about um, something that combines cultural heritage and creating new job opportunities within cultural heritage. Why? Because we are located in Idria, where basically cultural heritage is all around us, all around us. We live with that. And we need to um, we need to um, make something out of this cultural heritage. For those of you who don't know, Idria in the west of Slovenia is a UNESCO World Heritage uh, Site. It's also a UNESCO Geopark um, site. So lots of lots of cultural heritage our group of young people was just trying to think how to make a living in that town um, and throughout the years we figured it out that um, whatever we do we stumble upon cultural heritage and apparently cultural heritage is something that we have to work with um, besides the thing that we are all that we were all interested in the history of our town so to that competition we proposed um, the idea of culture heritage uh, of uh, heritage lab um, the, it was a concept idea 
uh, not implemented yet, just a concept, as I said. Uh, and surprisingly, we won. And um, of course, that was quite a, a shock um, because we were actually one of the few groups that was proposing something related to cultural heritage. All of the other teams were proposing very different ideas um, and only two or three were somewhere in the sphere of culture. Uh, so uh, apparently um, that was the right, uh, the right uh, way to go to. Um, and it took us some time, of course, to then gather the, all the power and then think how to actually implement that uh, afterward. Um, so we, um, the, the idea of the Heritage Lab starts with three main assumption, assumptions. The first one is that cultural heritage, heritage represents an immense potential, uh, but it's still, there are still many barriers. Uh, to that potential. Uh, we live with that because uh, it was said to yeah, us young people here in Idria, often that cultural heritage is a great potential and that that will stop out migration and that that will, that will create uh, jobs in Idria. Uh, but at the end, it didn't, or not so much as they uh, were saying, the policymakers were saying. So, and the second assumption was that um, that bridging culture, uh, bridging cultural heritage and entrepreneurship can have positive effect, effects. Uh, so not necessarily only economic positive effects, but also social, cultural, and environmental uh, impact in the local communities. And the third assumption was that the existing entrepreneurship courses are not enough, um, and that they actually miss that that specific area that combines cultural heritage and entrepreneurship. Uh, so that they focus mostly on um, general entrepreneurship, but they don't understand the challenges of the cultural heritage sector. Um, and because of that, they're not successful. Um, and we also uh, thought that within that value chain of cultural heritage, there are many opportunities and only by understanding that cultural heritage is a value chain, uh, we, can find, uh, uh, we can find entries into that value chain and create positive impact out of it. Uh, and this is how we identified nine areas of opportunities. And also maybe to comment on what was said before, tourism is just one of the areas where cultural heritage and business or entrepreneurship uh, can be matched. Uh, so these nine areas are uh, enlisted here. So ranging from, as I said, tourism to education, uh, gaming and the whole uh, film book, book publishing. So the whole uh, storytelling, uh, storytelling group, uh, events and festival, uh, gastronomy and agriculture, community building, real estate, uh, arts markets, arts and crafts. So, very different um, areas of opportunities. Why we wanted to say this? Because um, I think that too many times we only see the opportunities within the tourism sector, um, but that is only one part, and maybe the most obvious and the most uh, the largest part. Uh, but still, just one of the uh, options where uh, entrepreneurship can uh, thrive in the area of cultural heritage. So uh, what we want to then work with is to our target group are young people. And when we say young people, we mean between 20 and 30 years old who are already active in the community. So we are not trying to think how to, um, how, uh, so, so we are looking for people who are already active, who already showed some interest um, to, uh, to engage in either uh, cultural heritage or entrepreneurship. Uh, and of course, we, as someone who lives outside of the large metrop metropolitan areas, uh, we want to cater to that kind of uh, young people. So people from the peripheral uh, areas where um, this constant um, opportunity or threat of uh, moving outside of your local uh, town 
uh, is present. Um, and then we saw that um, that support that we need to give to that to that um, to that target group uh, needs to be so in a way, of course, general because uh, often there is no general support yet, but also individual. Uh, and we can achieve this through mentorships and, of course, uh, practical some practical benefits and actually motivation and engagement is one of the important topics that need to be addressed here so um, how to um, how to motivate these uh, young people to, uh, to to face the challenges of entrepreneurship and especially entrepreneurship within the area of cultural heritage which which is uh, a rigid sector um, we have to be honest um, and uh, so we uh, we saw that the this heritage lab uh, needs to offer the support uh, in four areas so or in four uh, ways one of them is through mentorships the second one is by just giving information and uh, understanding of the ecosystem which is a complex ecosystem for those of um, for those for those who are not familiar with that um with that uh, so cultural heritage ecosystem we need to give them opportunities to test their ideas and of course what's maybe the most important is to um, create the community where like-minded people support each other and help each other um, and we thought that this whole process of motivating and incubating and helping these young people is through three phases uh, in which each of the phases has a different goal. Uh, so the first phase, we see it as a very basic phase with basic um, uh, with basic um, topics. So especially giving the young people the basic understanding on what needs to be, uh, what area are they entering and how to um, tackle that. So the, the goal, um, uh, of the of the phase one um, is um, so to 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 reach um, this uh, to make it some sort of development plan, and um, we we thought that that could be achieved through uh, fifteen hours of and this is roughly when you say fifteen of mentorship support of giving that young these young people or the group of young people. Um, some sort of pizza money for this is very small amount just to cover these very basic small um, costs of uh, you know when you gather together and you need to uh, order uh, uh, something some small snacks and something to to drink uh, so to in a way to to uh, overcome that early small obstacle that uh, is there. And then the, the, what we also could offer is a co-working space and a bi-weekly newsletter with all the uh, information about uh, open calls, open tenders, opportunities uh, of uh, conferences. So all the, all, uh, all the information that, that these groups or these teams need to uh, find to, to be familiar within that ecosystem. Uh, and at that point, so before I said we could offer a uh, co-working space, which would be in uh, in Zagi Shaft. This is the this is actually the offices where where we are located at the moment. Um, and maybe just to uh, connect to what Fabrizio was saying uh, before, um, this is also in my opinion uh, how Faro Convention uh, looks like. So. Uh, having a, um, uh, a machine a house of the Idria mine shaft um, occupied by uh, offices and creative spaces and um, just uh, creating a different vibe when when working on these topics. Uh, so then in the second phase, uh, we offer 20 hours of uh, individual uh, support. So in the second phase, the idea is to uh, approach um, approach and uh, help uh, these teams with 
individual support. So not any more generalized, but to cater um, to cater them with information and support that is actually needed um, for the success of that team. So uh, we thought that there could be 20 topics and we will uh, later on show these 20 topics that we wanted to cover. Um, and the groups then choose uh, what of these 20 topics uh, could be interesting uh, or would benefit them. Again, uh, again, a burger money, a co-working space, we offer them a free website. We invite them to an annual study trip uh, somewhere abroad, ideally, to go together with our team of ID20 um, somewhere to, to get a sense of um, what people are doing elsewhere. Um, and as before, newsletters with uh, calls, information about tenders, about conferences, um, and so on. And then in the third phase, which actually is quite late in the development of this that idea. Um, the aim of that third phase is an upgraded and tested product. So here the, the idea is to actually test the product, upgrade it, test it again, um, and be confident that that is something that um, could and should work. And in that third phase, we offer, as I said, practical tests, uh, support in opening new sales channels, accounting and tech support, marketing support, and as before, co-working space, free website, uh, trips, and uh, newsletters and some fundraising support. So this is these are the three phases that we wanted, uh, that we propose. Um, and uh, we, will, of course, would want to hear your comments later on on these three phases uh, and the uh, support of these three phases uh, and but now it may be time to uh, also introduce the mentors that uh, we uh, envisioned for the first phase um, and those are uh, Bostian Yerman. Uh, Bostian actually was also our mentor um, to that competition in 2018 um, so he's a social innovation mentor um, and runs uh, his own team, uh, his own company. And the second one is Jean Menard, uh, who, who also um, is running uh, a startup here in Idria uh, in, a different, in a different branch, uh, but still um, Jean is co-founder of our institute um, and has a great knowledge of entrepreneurship and also cultural heritage. Um, so maybe at this point, Jean and Bostian, um, what would your um, what would your comments or what you, would your messages be? What uh, on talking about these three phases? What do you think is the most important in these three phases to to achieve or reach? If I may, yeah. actually because i'm a social innovation mentor so i would say social impact but uh, in, in in my case why we were working on that idea because uh, we saw many opportunities with uh, cultural heritage and also because of my field that i'm working on actually working with unesco and uh, with the un in general there was also quite a lot of debate how to bring all these things to the to the youngsters that are full of energy and have the motivation to do something and are already active in the field but lack the knowledge and uh, the support that gives them uh, a better chance to succeed and this is my main message so trying to give the right uh, knowledge the right support and the right also motivation uh, and the community of course that we are uh, eager to build uh, also with all the partners maybe that are here that we can give them a better chance to succeed of course failing is also a kind of success because you also learn out of it but uh, i think that the main thing is how to manage to optimize the time that we have and to bring the desired results as quick as possible 
So that's from my side, the mm -hmm. main the main idea and the main message. Jean yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe from, from my end, I just say that um, oftentimes when uh, we're talking with, let's say, wanting to be an entrepreneur in the cultural uh, sector, um, or maybe not, not even want to be entrepreneurs, but just those that want to work in cultural sector, is uh, that they view business as something, uh, let's say, extremely difficult and that, that you have to be something, I don't know, special to be able to even try uh, working on something that relates to business. So one of my goals would primarily be at least in the phase one to, to let them know that uh, business isn't something uh, scary, something extremely difficult, but something that uh, everyone can actually do. You just have to, let's say, uh, be willing to learn and uh, and to work towards it, so um, that we don't uh, that we don't get scared even before we uh, before we start. And then on the other side, of course, we have uh, let's say the the, the other problem that uh, or not problem but the challenge that um, people oftentimes uh, at least at least when talking about heritage and culture view business as something dirty so that we shouldn't maybe <laughs> dirty the, the 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 heritage with money and uh, profit and something like that uh, um so maybe maybe let's say the overall success would be how to find the balance between um making money to to finance the let's say further protection of the heritage and uh, further pro proliferation of cultural heritage and maybe yeah, uh, not view it as two competitive forces. Mm. And I think that that's also reflected in the topics that we want to cover within the phase one, uh, which are in a way three areas uh, that we want to cover. So one of them is the theory of change, which is mostly about social impact uh, of these businesses or of these ideas in the local communities and broadly. The second one is business model canvas. It's a, it's a common approach uh, to developing uh, business ideas. And I think it's especially entrepreneurial approach, uh, lean startup approach. Uh, and the third one um, is to understand the value chain of cultural heritage, to understand the ecosystem of cultural heritage um, and how things are, um, how, how the value uh, how the value uh, travels between uh, institutions, <clears throat> products, and services, uh, and where are opportunities within that value chain. Um, then in the, the second phase, mentors, um, is something that, uh, so as I said, the, the second phase covers much broader topics. And our idea is that, of course, the, the teams and the young people choose by themselves and together with the, our support, what of these, which of these topics are most needed for them. And we enlisted here uh, just some of the topics that um, we think needs to be covered. And later on, we would also want to hear your comments, um, whether these topics are um, reflect the needs uh, of the young people and the entrepreneurs in cultural sector out there. Um, we, it's far from an exhaustive list. Um, and maybe also later on after this event, your ideas and your inputs would be, uh, would be very much helpful. So again, topics here covered are a split between more business oriented topics, more socially uh, oriented and impact oriented topics and cultural heritage oriented topics. And um, I, I don't think that there's a, here, the, the, we don't have time to actually go through each of them, but um, you see that um, we, we try to cover different ones. And the, the mentors of these uh, topics would be selected afterwards. Uh, we know that we are not experts in all of these topics and that we have to engage other um, other people 
um, and other experts. Um, but of course, everything depends on the teams and the, the topic that the teams uh, need. Um, we've also prepared for them worksheets, um, which uh, for those of you who are interested, we can share later on um, with you. So it's different worksheets, especially for the phase one on uh, how to come up with good ideas, how to come up with interesting ideas to, um, to business uh, problems out there. Um, and uh, as I said, we will be happy to share them with you later on, if you're interested. Um, and we've prepared uh, a, small, um, a small toolkit, uh, a small booklet uh, in Slovenian though, um, on how to start. And then what I especially like about this booklet is that um, it was written by um, two of our colleagues, uh, Ursha and Dreitz, um, who themselves were thinking of how to write a toolkit um, that would also in a way help them. Um, so um, uh, it was not written by um, some experts uh, teaching others how things should be done, um, but it was written, let's say, more bottom up. Um, okay, and now I ended my part of the presentation, and especially now we would like to hear your comments on what we've been preparing and what we what we want to start here in Idria within this project. Um, I know that maybe it, would, it was hard to follow uh, through all of the, the phases and all of the uh, things that are planned. Um, now we would want to hear um, your, your opinions, your thoughts. Um, and to do this, um, to avoid having this large group and then waiting to, to, uh, to come uh, in line to, to start speaking, we would uh, split you in four groups. In each of the groups, one of the um, one of the um, our members will be there to moderate the discussion. This whole discussion will last uh, around twenty five minutes, and afterwards we will just uh, make a quick summary of what you've been discussing in the four groups, um, and uh, there we make a conclusion and end. Now I will ask the, the representatives of our teams, the mentors, uh, Jean, Bostian, uh, and Urban, to and myself, to summarize what we've been talking within the groups, especially the main comments and the main, um, yeah, the main remarks about the cult, about the Heritage Lab program. And first of all, I will ask. Uh, Jean. Yeah, so uh, we've had a very, very, let's say, good discussion. Uh, we didn't uh, necessarily go step by step, uh, but rather we had a, like a general general discussion about both the program and, uh, let's say, heritage sphere. Um, and uh, what was what are some, let's say, key points that we that we made is that um, one of the key lacking things is that we are not working well enough together, both on the local and on the national, uh, on the national level. So, uh, from let's say the perspective of method methodology, um, some networking events, some some events or or opportunities to meet many different stakeholders uh, on one place, exchange ideas would be very beneficial. So, and this goes for let's say public institutions working in the field as well as private initiatives, um, uh, private initiatives. Uh, one of the key points was also that um, it helps significantly if we, I mean, and tying in with the all this connected talk is that uh, we should try to avoid all the necessary 
stakeholders that we need in the already in the idea development stage um, because it will be much it is much easier to um, to go forward with a project on a sustain in a sustainable way if we have stakeholders have some form of ownership of the idea so that you, we can drive it forward and the sustainability mm -hmm. was um, was one of the things that uh, we we all agreed is uh, very important more from the standpoint of so, uh, something that uh, rob said um, in one of the earlier discussions that uh, i mean we have to be aware of all the different let's say sources of funding available and have that in mind already when we are drafting a project uh, a business idea uh, to know where the money will be coming from because what is the tragedy that happens apparently all over the place is that when the when the funding for a project or an idea stops the idea dies with it and nothing mm -hmm. uh, nothing comes out of it so this should be made a part of the business modeling uh, when drafting uh, when drafting the the, the, the business business yeah, idea yeah. so this i think was briefly what we were working uh, around and uh, i mean later on maybe someone can add something from the team yeah, as well yeah yeah uh, maybe urban you you tell us what you've been talking about in your group uh so to start by uh, heritage lab program um so we figured out that uh, for the ideas from cultural heritage we have a great place to start with uh with information and with offering uh, direction to those uh, to those ideas and that our phases how our setup for now are uh, really great as a something to start with but probably uh, with the time we'll need to we'll need to develop uh, oh, uh, to um, we'll see how the how it will go and maybe uh, we we also talked a lot about uh, other uh, areas, not really uh, strictly about Heritage Lab. And mainly, we come to the conclusion that there is uh, in Slovenia, especially, a huge potential in cultural tourism uh, and uh, to provide uh, decentralization of uh, uh, of uh, evolving of the tourism here. Mm -hmm. And also, um, when we talk about cultural heritage, we always uh, come to the topic of connecting uh, public and private. So that will be, I think, for us also the big challenge: how to um, how to maybe uh, set up some uh, long-term, maybe systematic uh, financial yeah. uh, sources for this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe Bostian. Okay, what? we tried yeah. to cover all the four uh, points. Uh, of course, the time limit was tight, so we were forced to sum up little mm -hmm. uh, little things. That uh, what what was the point about the program? When we have talked about the program, then uh, the main thing that popped up was actually. Uh, give the team the skills to collaborate. So actually the main uh, topic here is uh, how to uh, give them the, the right knowledge uh, that they are eager to collaborate. And also the main point about collaboration was also that we have to take in mind the public versus private uh, cooperation. So uh, that these things are very difficult, especially when we have a young team of youngsters that is working on such uh, on a topic and is actually trying to solve an issue by an institution that is mostly a public institution then actually uh, here things can get complicated in the regard how to make things happen when changes in the public sector can be difficult mm. and the other thing about the program that also uh, when making uh, the idea and working on the idea that we also have in mind the team. So it should be a cross sectoral team from different uh, angles uh, covering the topic, the, the project that, the, that they are working on. Uh, it of course depends on the type of project. Maybe it's in the field of uh, tourism or it's in the field of gastronomy. So 
we have to take this in, in mind by building the idea uh, working on the team. Uh, then about the obstacles, but this is also connected to the first question, is that we need to know the reg regulations very well. So what we can do and what we cannot do in the field of cultural heritage. So uh, this comes up also in the program and this comes out the biggest obstacle that came up. So that mostly, especially if we are, I don't know, not from the field, not in the field of cultural heritage, then we can go to a, straight to a wall and non, not knowing it. So we need to know the regulations. Yeah. And that can be very uh, frustrating, I guess. Yeah, what approaches and support work best? This came up, especially from uh, uh, the things that, uh, that we need to have a bottom-up approach. So actually we need community-based projects that are actually uh, on the field and we can make some uh, changes, uh, also social impact if these uh, things are being considered. So that mm. we have real case scenarios uh, and real problems from the field, from people that are actually working in uh, and uh, actually working in the fields that we are covering and then uh, trying to make the changes together with them. Uh, and what also works best is that uh, it was also going back to the, 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 the program and the regulations. So the obstacles, the, the basis uh, that we have is good. So uh, knowing the regulations, uh, making the team right and going uh, also uh, in the field that uh, we need uh, also to, to uh, sort out about the ownership. So this was one of the things that popped up. If we have an idea that is in, in a cross field of private and public, it needs to be sorted out about the ownership, that there are no um, complications in yeah. the later phases. And about the trends, just to be short, we have, of course, the, the digitalization, having in mind the sustainable development goals of the UN, uh, working in the field of uh, regenerative creative tourism, cultural tourism, um, and also here popped up the community-based projects. So the participation that is going from bottom up. So mm -hmm. that's it from my side. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bastian. So in our group, we, we discussed um, the, so the, the general uh, feedback. Um, one of the comments was that in a way, we don't need to exaggerate with the managerial modeling and try to be more creative and more reflective. So not to do everything by the book and understand management as a set of boxes in which uh, we need to fit uh, certain concepts or words. Um, another thing is that um, we need to uh, distinguish between, let's say, two different types of uh, possible uh, businesses. One are those that work directly uh, with museums and, and provide services for the museums. Set in, set, so these are things like setting up uh, exhibitions, uh, preparing materials. And the other group uh, of businesses or ideas are the ones that are more related to the cultural heritage itself. So not necessarily so much to the uh, being a, a subcontractor of a museum. Um, something that was stressed is, of course, the role of funding uh, here and especially the role of private funding. Um, so how to secure enough private funding um, beside public funding for such activities on the long term. Uh, so I think connects well with uh, things that Urban was saying before. And of course, how to engage a wider community. We've been discussing that sometimes asking people the same questions uh, over and over again can be uh, counterproductive um, and that um, although different calls for actions are needed and are required um, we need to be careful here not to exaggerate and not to um, not to uh, just uh, do uh, community engagement for the sake of We've been discussing about different um, examples, different interesting examples from elsewhere, different uh, platforms um, and different, uh, we also mentioned some specific uh, 
people who are doing interesting things and we will take a look into them and, and try to follow them and see how they're doing things. And the last part of our discussion was about the interesting trend of science and technology museums, because it seems like these museums are the ones that are the furthest, furthest ahead in rethinking the business models of their museums. And for example, they're not talking only about the history of science or the history of technology, but they're uh, looking at the current state and uh, also in the future. And they're often, um, and here we look at a few examples uh, where museums, for example, by design, they uh, foresee a space for startups within their premises. So within the museum, you have space for startups uh, or within their areas, you have uh, venues for startups, which um, fosters the exchange of ideas and fosters the collaboration between these two um, areas. And the last uh, but not, not least topic that was mentioned was the new Europe, European Bauhaus, an initiative by the European Commission that is currently going on. And as was said by Fabrizio, it currently it seems very fuzzy, uh, but also sounds very promising if things are done the way uh, they are um, described. And this is a new trend that will, of course, try to bridge between heritage and um, new development, also new business development. So that's what we've been discussing. Um, do we have any comment from the, from the rest of you, something that was not addressed or something that you think that was important, uh, that was in, said in the groups, but was not mentioned now in the summaries? No, maybe we can turn on the Mentimeter. Dreads, I would ask you for the last Mentimeter. Um, and here we have a question. What, in what areas um, can we find the most business opportunities, of course, related to culture or heritage? These are the same, uh, the same areas that we've been uh, mentioning before or that I have mentioned before. Um, and again, we have scale, so you can select the one that you uh, think holds the most opportunities. Okay, the, at the moment, gastronomy and agriculture is leading the way together with tourism and travel. As we said, tourism and travel are quite obvious ones, but apparently also gastronomy and agriculture are important topic which especially in this year when Slovenia is European um, astronomic region is a very important topic. Real estate seems to be the area with least opportunities related to cultural heritage, of course. Okay. Thank you for um, the answers to that question. Yeah, so the, the, the final question that we have is like just the, the, your final thoughts and your final comments. Also feel free to, um, to write these uh, comments, thoughts and ideas into the chat write, or write us an email. Uh, you can call us we are open for anything, um, any uh, comments, ideas, proposals. Uh, I've already received some of the collaboration proposals uh, in the meantime. So I'm, I'm glad that um, you, he, you see this event also as an opportunity to connect. Um, at this point, I would like to thank all of you to, uh, be, for being part of that discussion. As I said, probably it was a little bit strange discussion, um, but uh, in a sense that the format, we, maybe we are not so much used to that format uh, when organizing things online. I hope that um, you uh, got some new insights and got some new ideas um, from our side and also um, that um, most importantly, we did get, and I'm sure we did get interesting 
uh, thoughts and comments from your side. What we will do now is we will take all your comments and your or your um, proposals. We will um, lock ourselves up in a, in a room and revise our uh, program, revise our uh, project, and then we will send you the revised version um, and uh, so that you will see also what we have changed and what we have added or uh, removed um, to see the, um, so for you to be able to have the final version and discussion. Last but not least, I will again, I would again like to thank Center for Creativity and Museum of Architecture and Design for welcoming us to be part of uh, your, as I said before, uh, family. And also I would like to thank the European Union, the European Regional Development Fund for co-financing this event. Um, and uh, of course, I would like to thank our team here in IDRIA, um, all the, um, probably you've noticed we have um, in, in, the, in the nicknames you see ID20. ID this was our team who I uh, want to thank, say thank you again. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. Feel free to get in touch and let's, uh, let's keep the discussion going on in other um, channels. Thank you. Bye-bye.